Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guests today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back to some more bite-sized business advice. We got a good one lined up today. Everyone's love or hate topic. We're going to talk about people, talk about hiring and retaining people, but not only that, how to do it faster, how to do it better, which I'm excited to dive into. And we're going to unpack what's going on in the labor market. We got a lot going on today in a short episode. So I have a very special guest with us. It's going to help me do that. It's Ryan Anglin from Core Matters. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Brandon, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation because there's a lot of noise in the marketplace about quality people. Are there people? Is anybody working? Is everyone just shaking their butt on TikTok and making money? <laughs> Where do we start with this? Because we have first, I think we have to settle the noise down and then we could talk about hiring and retaining the right people. So give me a sense of the labor market. Yeah, so I think to finish what you were saying or just echo what you were saying, everybody's lazy, everybody's entitled, nobody wants to work anymore. Like that's the belief in the marketplace. And there, there's a few people out there like that. I mean, there. my nephew wants to be a, a Twitch streamer, like playing games for a living or something. And he's still a line cook at some restaurant, right? Like there's all these people that want to be influencers. They want to be the next, um, you know, Jimmy Donaldson and make b billions of dollars on YouTube, but that's not the reality. And so uh, I think a lot of what's going on right now is that there is the, the conversations broken down. It, it, it's, it's broken really due to COVID between the employer and the employee. And until we're willing to sit down and have a conversation again, we're going to keep dealing with the issues that we're dealing with. Well, I'm curious about that because uh, I want to have that conversation right now. Let, let's have a little bit of the conversation at least because yeah. so we work with businesses who are typically seven, eight figures in revenue, anywhere from five to 100, 150 employees um, and, and, and up from there on our larger contracts. And this is a conversation that we need to sit down and have because I don't think it's true that everybody's lazy and everybody wants to be an influencer. So what what is this? What is the short version of this conversation that we need to have between employer and employee? Well, I think what happened with COVID is it just put a magnifying glass over a problem that had already existed for decades, which is that employees have options. Right? Employees don't have to feel like they're stuck or they're handcuffed to a particular employer or to a particular industry. And when we divided people into essential and non-essential workers, I think that really exposed this issue when we basically said, hey, all those people that serve us on a regular basis, you're not essential. <laughs> Like that, you're not that important. It made them go, wait a minute. If that's how my employer thinks about me, if that's what my industry thinks of the work that I do, I need to go find another industry to work in. And that's why we're struggling in healthcare. That's why we're struggling in retail. That's why we're struggling in hospitality. Because we told all these people, you're not that important and we don't really care about you. We're going to work you until you quit. Or we're just going to put you on the sidelines because we can't be open right now. And all these people said, no, I can do better. Like, I, I don't work just because that's not my purpose in life is to work. It works so I can take care of my family and experiences and do things. And so this shift happened where people said, you know what? If I still have enough money after my weekend to get me through a couple of days next week, maybe I don't go into work on Monday. <laughs> If I still have enough money to do the things that I want to do, maybe I don't need that high paying job and I can focus more on experiences and some other things. And I think there was just a magnifying glass put over the employee employer relationship during COVID and all these employers are like, I can do better than this. Yeah. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank the United States government for calling your own citizens non-essential. That was <laughs> prime time leadership right there. Oh, Way yeah. to go. Uh, I joke about that, but also, you know, at the same time, I think a lot of employers did have that sort of mentality that the employees are here to serve me and this company, and they're just cogs in the wheel and we can replace them. And I'm all for this shift, first and foremost, because I think you need to build a better culture where people want to be there. They want to add to it and they want to be a part of a team, part of something bigger. 
So yeah. it's a very good and important shift that we're seeing in the marketplace. But the real question is, how do we navigate this where the employer doesn't take advantage of the employee and vice versa? Because that's the the common slip up or, or the easy slip up, if you will, is for either one to take advantage of the other, which we don't want to do. That's that's yeah. just not right from, from either perspective. So where do we start this conversation um, with, with your technology, hiring people? Do we talk about the people first or the culture first? I'm curious. Well, at the end of the day, if an employer wants to grow, if they want to keep their people, they have to be attractive to the right people. And it, it all comes down to attraction. Right? Think of this as a relationship. Now, I don't want to start cutting hairs about dating your employees and all that, even though I'm going to use a dating analogy here real quick. But, um, but here's the reality. As an employer, I need to be attractive to employees. If, if the only people that are coming to apply for my jobs are the worst of the worst, are the bottom feeders, if I can't get top people to apply to come work for me, I'm probably not very attractive to good people. And that's a harsh truth, but you need to hear that, that if you can't get good people to come work for you, you can't get them to stay. It's probably because good people are like, I need better. Like, I don't need this. And so the first thing you've got to do is start taking a look inside and in the mirror and saying, am I attractive to the people I want to attract? And it's the same thing we would do if we were entering the dating market, right? Like if we were going to go dating, uh, if, if I was looking for someone new, I'd be like, I got to get a haircut. I got to shave. I got to buy some new clothes, like maybe hit the gym and lose 10 pounds. Like I would be thinking, what do I need to do to attract someone? But as employers, we think, oh, if we just take this age old job description and we post it on Indeed, I'm good. And then we're frustrated when the good people don't show up. So that's the first thing we have to do is the employer needs to take ownership of this problem and realize that they are the only ones that can solve it. It is not about the job market. It's not about generations. It's not about government. It's not about any of that. As the employer, you need to take ownership and say, I have complete control over this and I can fix it. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way you can do anything in your life, right? Is taking responsibility for the parts you can influence. So once we do that, or assuming we do that the right way, then I, we have to have the conversation about finding those people, attracting them, yes, and then filtering through the number of applicants, because that's kind of the downside, if you will, is if you become attractive to the best, you're still attractive to not the best. So where does your technology come in, your process to filter through and hire the best possible people and do it fast? Well, what we see almost across the board, and especially in the trades, which is an industry that I'm incredibly passionate about, is that almost all the time, they've never sat down and said, what does a great employee look like? How do we know when we find a good one? And we've worked with companies in all sorts of industries, and they all suffer from the same thing. They don't know how to define the right employee. Because when I ask that question, Usually they tell me, oh, they show up on time. They respect the team. They like working with other people. They take care of the customer. No one ever tells me they can turn a wrench. They can use our CRM. They can read our scripts. No one ever tells me that stuff. What they tell me is the right person behaves a certain way. And if you haven't sat down as the employer and identified what's the right kind of behavior, you're never going to be able to attract the right kind of people. But here's the cool thing is when you've defined the right behavior and you put it out there to attract the right people, the wrong people are going to see that and go, I don't want to be a part of a team like that. It looks like they hold people accountable <laughs> and, and they have <laughs> metrics and, and they're going to measure my performance. Like I can't hide out there. I don't want to be a part of that. And it's really interesting. We see a significant de decrease in applicant volume when they follow our process, but the quality just shoots up. And all of a sudden, it's like we had one client say in, in nine months before he met us, doing it his own way, he had found six people that he liked. He implemented our process, stopped spending money on the job boards, and now he gets six people a day that he likes. He's like, I don't need this. Like he had to turn everything off. He's like, I have just too many people now applying that all look good. So now he gets to pick from the best of the best because he might only need to hire one person a month or one person a quarter because he's keeping his people 
And now he sees these applications coming in six a day. Like he gets to pick now. That's incredible. Most most people don't find themselves in that position, but it's it's a place of you can almost like relax and take a breath. You're not so stressed sifting through resumes. And I like to call people, not all people, but some people, the the professional interviewers where mm-hmm. you know they look good and then you get on on the job in three weeks and it's like, that's not the person I interviewed at all. I think that's a is that a clone of this person? Yeah. Um, but can you walk me through this process? Can you give me, I guess, the high level highlights? Well, let me do this too while we're talking because this is we don't have enough time to unpack this fully. Um, you wrote a free book on this where the the listener, wherever you are watching, listening, it's on the screen. It'll be in the show notes down below. You can go download this book. Um, but I am curious about the highlights of what are we putting in the job descriptions to filter these things out. Um, to to identify with behaviors? Are you literally spelling it out word for word? Or are you being more uh, passive at how you hint at what those behaviors look like in a person? Well, Brandon, real quick, let me clarify something about the free book offer. It's actually a print copy of my book called Hire Better People Faster. And the only thing I ask is you just help me with a little bit of shipping and handling. And I'll, uh, and I actually I'll sign the book and mail it to you. So uh, it. it's not a download. It's a full book. You can buy it on Amazon. You can get the audio book. Uh, it's got all this stuff in it that you're asking. But the first thing we have to do to answer your question about the job ad and what we're really putting out there is we have to recognize that what we post online when we need to hire somebody is not a job description. It's an advertisement. Like think about this for a minute. If Chevy wants to sell the new Corvette, they can create one of two types of ads. They can create one, which they have this ad, of people enjoying life, hearing the the roar of the road and the roar of the engine and laughing and grinning and just being like, this is amazing. That's one type of ad. Or they can take that window sticker and say, if you pay us this, these are all the things you're going to get. Well, it's almost impossible to find a window sticker online. <laughs> you have to go through people's Instagram feeds to find one because Chevy knows window stickers do not sell Corvettes. They know that a 60 second ad of people living the life that you dream to live sells $160,000 cars. The same thing applies when we're writing our job ad. Do we wanna take that thing that HR put together a decade ago that says this person must be able to do lift 50 pounds and be able to use this software and be able to do this? And here's all the ways we're gonna measure their performance and here's the benefits you get. Or do we want to write an ad based on the idea that people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses? Like we know this is true. So if people are leaving someone else to come work for you, they don't need a job description. They know how to do the work. What they need to know is what's it like to be a part of your team? How long before I feel like I belong there? Am I going to regret thinking the grass is greener? Or am I going to say, whoa, this really is better? That's what we need to be putting in our ads is talking less about the work and more about the people. Like they need to know how, what it takes to be a part of your team more than they need to know what it takes to do the job. Mm. Yeah, that's powerful. And I guess the interesting thing that you said is people leave um, bosses, not, not jobs, which leads me to kind of, I guess the next phase, if you will. And I'm I'm sure there's a hundred steps in in between. So let me just jump ahead. The hiring piece, the attracting piece, important. Hiring piece, also very important. Onboarding is important. Now what? Because we have people who are in these seats, in our companies, on our teams, and we don't want them to leave bosses. We want them to be part of this team, especially in the trades where you tend to focus. I'm sure that the industry average for a uh, duration of, of in being employed is like three weeks for most companies <laughs> so we that's an extreme scenario but if this works yeah. there this will work anywhere yeah how do we get people to stay on our teams because i'm sure we have to look within ourselves too just like you said in the beginning taking responsibility so how do we keep them on our teams and how do we become the leader that that our teams need to have well everything we do is very much an employee first approach so we step into the shoes of the employee and we say what is it that these people want so i already talked about the fact that people don't leave jobs they leave people if we believe that to be true then we need to create a marketing machine which recruiting is marketing we need to create a marketing machine to to promote our people because that's what people are looking for they're looking for a new person 
We also know that when people are onboarded, it's a very stressful time. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of validating what they believe to be true. There are expectations that are or are not being met. And if we step into their shoes for a minute and say, how do we get in front of that? Then we can create an onboarding process that's incredibly successful. In fact, I tell people, your number one goal in the first week of onboarding with a brand new employee, the only goal you have is for them to go home at the end of the week and tell their friends and family, best decision I ever made. If you can do that in the first week, you can double, triple, quadruple the amount of time they're going to stay with you. So think about how much it's costing you to constantly fill new people. So if you paid somebody for a week and all you did was pour into them, teach them how to belong, onboard them well, and they went home and say, this was the best decision ever. You've created a raving fan that's going to stick with you a long time. But to answer your question, we have people that are on the team that we can't onboard. And so now what do we do? Well, let's take a look at it again from the employee's perspective. Why do people come to work? Some people come to work because they feel that producing in the work that they do is enjoyable or life's purpose or whatever. But the majority of people come to work so that they can support a lifestyle. Now, I'm not talking about everybody wants mansions and vacations to the Bahamas and those kinds of things. They want to take care of their family. Or maybe they are going to school at night because they want to improve themselves and get into a different career. Whatever it is, take a look at it from their perspective. If you want to engage your people, if you want to get them to go, I like being here, the question I want you to answer is, how can you help them achieve their personal goals? See, too often we get hung up on professional goals. Oh, Brandon, I'm going to make sure that you have the best certifications and that you go to the best training and that you can do your job better than anyone else. Well, who's that all about? It's all about me. But if I said, oh, you want to get out of debt and buy a house? Let me connect you with the right people. Let's put together some budgeting. Let's talk about, and you don't have to share with me. I can bring financial advisors and I can bring mortgage people in that'll help you repair your credit because eventually they're going to help you buy a house. Right? I can create connections in the community to help you achieve your personal goals. One of the ones that we do a lot of in the trades, a lot of companies in the trades, they pay weekly. And the reason they pay weekly is because the people in these jobs don't know how to get from one week to the next. Like they couldn't do biweekly and they actually pay all their bills. So we bring in financial gurus like Dave Ramsey and Smart Dollar. And we say, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to teach you how to budget and save. And do this stuff. And these people are like, finally, someone teaching me how to live. And when we invest in people personally, we'll engage them in ways that you can't even imagine. Yeah, I, I love that aspect. Often people will come to us and they'll say, you know, my I, I have the worst employees. They're not performing. And typically what I'll ask them is, what are you doing to support their personal mission for working at your company? People don't like when I ask that question because <laughs> yeah. often it's nothing. And I love that you take that approach of supporting the individual and supporting their personal mission because you're right. I mean, the more you engage someone with, with working for you and with you, more importantly, the more likely they are to stay. And nobody's doing that, especially in the trades. I think that's completely unique. So I love that you take this approach. Thank you. So Ryan, we could like I said, we could go down every single rabbit hole here and, and talk for hours. You have a book for the listeners where you can continue this discussion on your own. Uh, I encourage you to go take Ryan up on that offer. It's on the screen. Again, it's in the show notes, corematters.com slash free book. Uh, such a generous offer. I appreciate that. But I have a question before we wrap up. Uh, and it's a question for a question. There's a giant lit up question mark behind me. You can probably sense how much I love questions and we believe that what if powerful questions get you powerful answers. So in terms of hiring better people faster, the takeaway from this episode, what would you like to leave to the listener? What's that question, that one question they can ask themselves for the rest of today or the rest of this week to say, or, or to get them thinking in the right direction and improve the way they attract onboard and retain top talent. I mean, I've already mentioned it. So if to put it in a question, what do I need to do or who do I need to become to attract the best people? Mm. Amen. I love it. I absolutely love it. Ryan, thank you for a fantastic interview. I appreciate you 
sharing your knowledge on this topic with us. Thank you. For those of you watching and listening, wherever you are, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you take advantage of this offer on the screen, corematters.com slash free book. That's awesome. Hiring is so challenging in business, especially doing it right and then doing it fast all at the same time. Wild. I love this. I love this conversation. Thank you, Ryan, for being here. And thank you for you for watching and listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Harmonious Alone.